day and night, day and night. Uh, today, my goal is to remind you just how important it is to meditate on God's word and what the results are. Because I'll tell you one thing, we don't come to the word of God and get nothing. We get more of God. We get more of who he is. Uh, for some of us, when we hear the word meditate or the word meditation, it rubs us the wrong way, especially in this culture. We hear the word meditation and we think of new age, the new age movement, or we think of yoga, or we think of Hinduism. But there is a night and day difference between New Age meditation and Christian meditation. When New Agers meditate, their goal is to empty their minds. Their goal is to empty their minds and to connect with creation, to become one with what God has created. By the way, this practice is a demonic practice and it only opens oneself to evil spirits. By the way, just in case you didn't know this, the word yoga means yoked with a Hindu god, connected with a demon, is what the word yoga actually means. But when a Christian meditates on God's word, right, he meditates on God's word to fill his mind and to connect with the creator. He fills one's mind with the very mind of God. What is the mind of God? The Word of God. The Word of God is the mind of God. So when the Christian meditates on His Word, we are literally growing in the mind of God Himself. We connect with the Creator. The New Agers, they want to be one with the earth. We want to be one with the Creator of heaven and earth. Amen? And so then we're called to meditate on God's Word. The mind, as you know, is a powerful thing. Our mind is a powerful thing, and whoever controls the mind controls the person. I think we all understand that. This is why we are to guard our minds and renew our minds. That is our way of thinking all the time. And we do this by what? By meditating on God's Word. You see, the Word of God has the power to realign our way of thinking with his way of thinking. So the moment you see that you're kind of getting off track with the way you're living, with the way you're speaking, with the way you're thinking, you got to get back on the word. You got to get back in the word. You need to get back to meditating on what God has said. And it aligns your heart. It aligns your path. And it aligns your eyes and your mind back with God. That's what meditating on the word of God does. The Word of God has a reinforcing element to it. It reinforces what we already know. And it brings to our attention the things that we've forgotten. And we're living in a time where we can easily forget many things that God has said. Because from what I see in the polls, there are not too many who honor the meditation of God's Word and the reading of God's Word. So then, the mind is a powerful thing. Whoever controls the mind controls the person. And we know that there are two main individuals who want to control our minds. There are two individuals who want our minds. The first one, as you know, is our good and loving Lord, and the other is our worst enemy, Satan. The Lord wants our minds for what reason? He wants to protect us. He wants to protect us. He wants to give us the way He thinks so that way we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. He wants to give us His way of thinking so that way we overcome the devilish darts of the devil, right? To overcome the ways of the world. And so we know that the Lord wants our minds to protect us while Satan wants our minds to what? To destroy us by ultimately deleting God from our Thoughts, And that's where you get Darwinism. That's where you get atheism. That is the work of Satan. Do away with anything that has to do with the true God from people's minds. You do that, you got them. You do that, you got them. John 10.10 says, in John 10.10, Jesus says, The thief comes to kill and to steal and to what? To destroy 
He doesn't come to give life. He doesn't come to give anything good. And he doesn't come to rebuild anything. He demolishes people. And he does that mainly through his lies. That's okay. So the, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus comes for what? To give abundant life. To give abundant life. How do you get abundant life? It all starts up here. What you know about God. What you know about his nature. What you know about sin. What you know about righteousness. What you know about the power of the Holy Spirit. What you know about Satan and his tactics in this world. That's abundant life. Abundant life is to be able to know God and to live according to that knowledge. And so we have two that want our minds, God and the devil. The main way in which God gets our minds is through His Word. It's through His Word. And one of the main ways in which Satan gets our minds, I'm sure you can already guess this, it's through media, mass media. All kinds of different avenues and ways and roads in, in which the enemy gets into our minds, which then gets into our hearts. But the way in which we get God's mind is to read and meditate on God's word. That's it. And this is the reason why it's so extremely important to watch what you consume. It's important to watch what you Consume. I'm telling you, there are far too many Christians eating junk. And a junky life is the result of it. And so we need to eat from the living word and ways of God to be like God. Jim Morrison, the late lead singer of the band The Doors, has a famous quote and it goes like this. Whoever controls the media controls the masses or controls the multitudes. And you and I both know that Satan is the little G God of this world. The prince of the air. Waves, if you want to add to that. Most of it at least. And so we know that the enemy is in charge of the media. We know that the enemy is in charge of much of the entertainment. Much of what pumps out of that tube and into our eyes and into our hearts. And so then we have to be very careful with what we consume. We can choose to consume the bread of life, which is Christ and the word of God. Or we can choose to consume the evil of this world. If we neglect the Word of God, spiritually speaking, we will become weak and malnourished. In the same way, if we neglect eating physically, we become weak and anorexic and so on, right? If we stay away from physical food, and so then we need to eat from the Word of God. Now, before, before we read out of the book of Joshua... I want to give you a brief background, but if you would just open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 1 and leave your marker there for a moment. We have to keep in mind that all of us are consumers, but what we consume has everything to do with how strong or how weak we will be in God. Moses the Great, I call him the Great because I think he's one of the greatest disciples in my opinion. He was known as the most humble man on, in the world. He's dead now. In Joshua chapter 1, Moses is dead. And Joshua is to lead in Moses' place. I don't know about you, but that would be nerve-wracking. Because if we're looking at the size of foot, physically speaking, I'm sure Moses was probably a nine and, uh, and uh, no, Joshua was a nine and Moses was probably a 15, right? How are you going to fill those shoes in? And so the baton was being handed over and the mission must go on. And so there's a lot riding on Joshua now. There's a lot of weight on his shoulders. He has to get Israel into the land of Canaan and conquer Israel's enemies. This isn't an easy task. In fact, this is an impossible task. Uh, without God on his side, without Yahweh fighting for him, it, it's just impossible. It cannot be done. But one thing I want you to be encouraged with is this. 
One man with God is the majority. I'm sure you've heard that before. One man with God is the majority. That's where our power lies. Moses led Israel out of the land of Egypt and he led, he led them into the wilderness. But now Joshua will lead Israel out of the wilderness and into the promised land. And by the way, this is one of the greatest leadership transitions that we find in the Bible. Uh, the other parallel is Paul handing the baton to Timothy. But the Lord is going to remind Joshua that the secret to spiritual success, listen to this, the secret to spiritual success will be a love for God's word and an understanding and an acknowledgement and an appreciation for his presence. God is with us. Amen. That is going to be the secret to anyone's spiritual success. Moses was successful the whole time that he obeyed the Lord's word. When Moses obeyed God, he was successful. But when Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to it as the Lord had commanded, that was the end of his ministry. That was the end of his life. That's where it ended. Moses' ministry was strong and prosperous up to the point that he disobeyed God. What is the secret to spiritual success? It is obedience. It is loving, joyful obedience to God's word. All of it. To some degree, it is the same for us. When we obey God's word, we'll be strong and spiritually prosperous. But when we disobey or ignore or neglect the meditation of God's word, the study of God's word, the proclamation of God's word, the obedience of God's word, we will become weak and worldly. Weak and worldly. So that's the backdrop of the book of Joshua in chapter 1. Now let us read together there. We're going to read from verses 1 to 10. But my main passage will be verse 8. Your subtitle may read God's commission to Joshua. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, that's the Jordan River, and you and all this people to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. I don't know about you, but if that was a word from the Lord, I'd be treading all over the place. He says, I, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong. We're going to hear that command four times. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance to the land of the land, which I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Why? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He heard that and then he did this. Verse 10. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people saying, 
pass through the camp and command the people saying, prepare provisions for yourselves. For within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. He says, you're going to be with me. Let's go. Let's march forward. And by the way, that should be the prayer, our prayer, every time we take upon any endeavor that we do for the Lord. Whether it's an outreach, whether it's a preaching, whether it's taking care of the kids in the back, whatever it is that God has you doing, you say, Lord, be with me, go before me. May your grace be with me. May your hand be with me. May I prosper in this work for your glory. Right? That's got to be the attitude. Anytime you go before God, you're going to end up like Moses. You're going to flop and end back up in the wilderness for 40 years until you understand that you're not strong enough. Okay? So we have to keep that in mind. The Lord goes before us. He is with us. And we, when He says to do something, we do it. When He says that the church of Christ will prevail, that the gates of hell will not prevail against it, that He will build it, we believe that and we march forward with that understanding. Whatever it is that He says, like He says, all power has been given unto me, now go and make disciples. What does that mean? It means what it, mean, it, means what it says. All power has been given, it to him, been given to Him. He gives that authority to us and we go do the work. Amen? And so we have to think that way about everything that's written in Scripture. The Lord is with us. He is for us. And if He said to do it, He is with us. Let's read that passage one more time. Joshua 1.8. Because this is the passage I want to expound this morning. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. That's a command. But you shall meditate in it day and night. That you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. When it says the book of the law. This refers to the first five books of the Bible. Also known as the Torah or the Pentateuch. From Genesis to Deuteronomy. Another way to refer to the book of the law is to simply say the word of God or to say the Holy Bible. And so then God is basically telling Joshua, don't let my word depart from your mouth. Don't let the, the sacred scriptures depart from your mouth. One thing we have to understand is that Joshua only meditated on the first five books of the Bible because that's all he had. He told him, meditate in the law, meditate in this book. And all he had was five books to meditate in. Now, by the time David was born, he had seven books to meditate in. Seven books of the Bible. Uh, by the time David was born, they also added the book of Joshua and the book of Judges. As you know, the book of Judges was written by the prophet Samuel. And those who came after King David and Solomon had even more books. And they had the book of Proverbs, the book of Psalms, uh, the book of Job, the Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes as well. What's my point? My point is this, that God's people were called to meditate on God's word up to the point of the books that were written or the books that were available. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. All five books, Joshua, shall not depart from your mouth. Today we have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament, we have all 66 books. From Genesis to Revelation. Again, while Joshua was commanded to meditate on the first five books, and King David was commanded to meditate on the first seven books because that's all he had the church of Jesus Christ is commanded and expected to meditate on the entire Bible the entire Bible and so to some degree the command for us is greater than it was for Joshua in the sense that we are called to meditate on more revelation than Joshua had I don't know about you, but I see that as a privilege because more revelations means more of God. We know more about God than Joshua did in his time. If 
We are students of the Word of God cover to cover. I find that as an absolute privilege. The Lord is saying, dig in. Jump into this treasure box and dig in. We have been given more light. We have been given more revelation of God than Joshua did. And all of those who came after him in the Old Testament. We had more revelation than than John the Baptist. I think the two men that I think had the most revelation was Paul the Apostle and John the Revelator. The Apostle who died last. They knew most But we are just as privileged because God hasn't held nothing back from us. He has given us the whole story, the whole shebang, if you will. Amen. Amen. So for Joshua, the book of the law means the first five books of the Bible. The book of the law means the entire Bible for us. If there is one thing that none of us or should I say that all of us should avoid is to stand before God and have to stand there as one who never read the entire Bible. And listen to me. It's not the attitude that says, well, I read all these books. Check! Because many men in prison have read those books, but those books haven't done anything to their hearts. And there are many Christians who read and the Word does nothing to theirs as well. So there's a right way to study God's Word. But there are many people who are going to stand before God and have to admit with tears in their eyes and shame on their face. I have not read the entire Bible. In fact, I didn't even care about it. If we can just be honest. And so I'm encouraging you today, while you're still breathing and you have life, get that book and read it. Yeah. Book by book, just read the way, all the way through and ask God for wisdom and strength to do it. Amen? We are more privileged than Joshua, as I already said. We are more privileged than David in a sense. And so I pray that none of us would neglect this beautiful book. That none of us would neglect the Word of God. And some of us have excuses. I've had mine. Well, I've got this to do and I've got that to do. The reality is all of us have 24 hours in a day. If you have more than 24 hours, come up to me after so we can pray for you. You're losing your mind. (laughs) We all have 24 hours a day. You work eight hours. You sleep eight hours. What do you do with the rest? The last eight hours. By the time you're 60 years old, you have, you have slept for 20 years, and you have, um, you have slept for 20 years, you have worked for 20 years, what have you done for the other 20? By the time you're 60 years old, you've got 20 years to do something for God, to know Him, to know His Word, to dig deep, and to get all that you can from Him. Amen. How are you doing? How are you doing? I'm always challenging myself. Joshua was to meditate on the creation account of God's creating powers. He was to meditate on what happened in the Garden of Eden. The first five books. Just think about that. This is what he's telling them. I want you to meditate on the revelation that I've given you so far. I want you to meditate on the fall of man. I want you to meditate on Noah and the reason why I flooded the entire globe. I want you to think about these things. I want them to affect your heart and your life. I want you to meditate on the Tower of Babel. I want you to meditate on the fact that I called a pagan, who is your father Abraham, to follow me so that way I can raise up a family from him to know me and to represent me in this world. I want you to meditate on the fact that this family was called to serve me. He wanted them to meditate on the life of Joseph like we're doing on Wednesdays. And to meditate on everything that took place in the land of Egypt. He wants him to meditate on the rise of Moses, on the spitting of the Red Sea. He wants them to meditate on the great deliverance of God. He wants Joshua to meditate on what happened in the wilderness, all the experiences. He wants him to meditate on the tent of worship. He wants him to meditate on all the duties that the Levites have, the priests have. He was not only commanded to think think about these things, he was commanded to speak about these things always. 
always. To which I say, welcome to true Christianity. Amen. Welcome to true Christianity. True believers who are mature in the faith love the Bible and they go after God with the revelation they've been given. And that's how they grow. And that's how they conquer. And so then we see that God is telling them, look, Joshua, you've got five books. You better know them well. And these books, he says, shall not depart from your mouth. That's the next thing he tells him. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. The word of God shall not depart from your mouth. Joshua was to always be reading God's word. In his day, it was common for them to read out loud. I don't know about you, but I like to read out loud when I'm reading God's word. Just kind of pace back and forth and just read out loud. But Joshua was not only to read God's word, he was to speak and proclaim God's word. That's what it means when it says, shall not depart from your mouth. How many Christians have allowed the enemy to strip the word from their hearts and lips? He tells Joshua, not you, Joshua. Not you. When the word of God departs from our hearts, it will depart from our mouths. It's the way it works. If it's not getting in, it's not coming out. If it's not getting in, it's not coming out. And so then, we have to guard the word in our hearts. And we see this all over the evangelical world today. For example, there are more and more pulpits preaching social justice instead of the word of God, which is the true gospel. And there are many, many examples like this one. The word has departed from many people's mouths. People will not speak on behalf of God due to fear, due to the praise of men, and due to many other things. By the way, if the word departs from Joshua's mouth, being the main leader over the rest of the elders, if it departs from the leadership, you best believe that it's going to depart from the rest of the people. It's going to depart from the rest of the congregation. When the word departs from the pulpit, it departs everywhere else. Listen, our words give us away. How do you know somebody? Just hear them speak. Sit down with them for at least an hour and you'll know who they are and where they are. We all speak from the heart. So our words prove whether or not we're reading and meditating on God's word faithfully. You will talk about the things you love. You can't help it. Faithful Bible readers stand out like a sore thumb. And Joshua was one of those. And I pray that all of us desire to be one of those. Bible thumpers, call me what you want. I love God. For example, in chapter, chapter 24, Joshua gives the rest of Israel's leaders an important history lesson, lest they forget. He speaks of Abraham, he speaks of Moses, he speaks of God's great power and the dangers of not taking God's word seriously. So we can say then that Joshua was well versed. When God told Joshua, Joshua, meditate on these five books. In chapter 24, you find out that he did what God commanded him to do. He was able to give them a little history lesson. It was right on point. He had to know Genesis and Exodus to say what he said. Do we? And so I pray that we're challenged. Always challenged. Amen? Amen. The book of Genesis and Exodus was spewing out of his heart and out of his mouth and into the hearts and ears of Israel's elders. So then let's read God's word. Let's get it in our hearts. Let's read it out loud. Let's preach it to ourselves. Let's preach it to others. <laughs> I preach to myself a lot. I preach to myself way more than I preach to you, just so you know. I do. 
Like if you added up the hours, it doesn't compare. That's what we're called to do. To read God's word and allow it to affect us. To transform us. Amen? Amen. To approach the word in any other way is a waste of time and a waste of life. He says, meditate in it day and night. Does that mean that you got to walk around with your Bible in your face everywhere you go? No. It's the Bible in your heart. It's the Bible in your heart. It's the Bible in your mind. Day and night. Now, if somebody says, I want you to focus on this thing 24 hours a day, you and I are going to say, this must be very valuable. How much is this thing worth? Right? That's what I would ask. You literally want me to stand right here and think about this right here and guard this right here for 24 hours of my day? If God is commanding us to do that, He's telling us something. He's saying the most important thing in all the universe is God's Word. That's it. What's the most important? What's the most valuable? Everything that comes from the heart and mouth of God. Jesus says, every word by every word that comes out of the mouth of God, we live. He says, day and night, like bury your face and your heart in this book, keep it in there. Spurgeon once said, visit other books, but live in the Bible. I like that advice. Visit other good books and live in the Bible. Don't visit non-good books. Burn them. Do what they did in Acts. Burn them. Buy things that will cause you to grow in the knowledge of God. In your love for God. Here God is clearly telling us to be faithful in Bible reading day and night. We read, we think, we ponder. He wants us to concentrate on what we read and everything that He's revealed to us. Concentrate. I don't know about you, but that seems like a very difficult thing to do in our time. Why? Because there's a notification here, a notification there, an email here, an email there. We got to go here and buy this and go over there and take back that. And there's so many things that are just eating up all of our attention, all of our time. And it's so hard to concentrate. But God is saying here, concentrate. If you don't concentrate, you will not win. If you're not willing to concentrate on me and my word, you will not grow. Have it your way. But the Lord will give you all that He is if you want it. We're not called to speed read. I tell people to snail read. I always encourage people to read slowly, prayerfully, and carefully. God desires that we be saturated by His word. That our minds would be filled with lofty thoughts of who He is in all of His awesome ways. For us to be God conscious 24 hours a day and to enjoy every second of it. No greater or better subject than God. For us to be God conscious at all times and for us to be able to see everything through the eyes of God and the lens of Scripture. Why does God want you to meditate day and night? Because He's giving you His eyes. He's giving you His mind. He's teaching you His will. He's showing you His ways. No man knows God. Until he knows God through his word. That's the way it works. Far too many people are just content with the little. The little. But the Lord says there's so much more. Now imagine if uh, Joshua said, Okay, Lord, I can have everything. Well, I'm just going to cross the Jordan. I'm going to settle there. I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to win any more territory. I'm going to stay there, put up my tent and be happy. I'm saved. 
I'm out of Egypt. I'm out of the wilderness. I crossed the Jordan. Let's stop. What would have happened? He would have never become the man that he became. He would have never conquered the enemies that he conquered. But what makes a man go and conquer all of his enemy, place by place, region by region, all the Canaanites, one group tricked him, the Gibeonites. But for the most part, he was conquering everyone. Why? Because he was not content with the little. And there are far too many Christians who are content with very little to nothing. Very little to nothing. Not me. I'd rather not live if I don't get the opportunity to seek God again. I'd rather not live. Why? Because He's more important than breath. More important than food. More important than anything you can spend your money and your time on. To meditate on God's Word, day and night takes prioritizing. What's most important? You answer that question and you're already on the right track. Now if you get your feet on that track and you start moving forward, more power to you. Prioritizing God first. God first. When I think of that, I think of two sisters, popular sisters, Martha and Mary. One said, God first. The other said, dishes first. They said, no, God's first. They said, no, cooking and making good food is first. Not Mary. Mary knew who was first. She sat down at his feet and she hung on every word that came out of his mouth. That's when you know Jesus is in the room. That's when you know that he is the most important, most precious, most valuable person in all the universe. And other things will have to take back seat. Amen? She understood that. I pray we do too. Prioritizing God first. Most important. It takes sacrifice. Joshua was willing to sacrifice. His children and his wife were at home if he had some. His other responsibilities took the back seat. He had a sword in his hand. He had to conquer his enemies. He might die. He might bleed. He might get a sword to the chest. But Joshua was willing to sacrifice to get all that God had promised him he would get. Sacrifice. Sometimes other things have to go. Other things have to go. Now listen to me. If you don't want to go further, that's fine. But you're always going to be challenged in this ministry to go further. Always. There is no way that I'm going to waste my time up here and not challenge you to go higher, to go deeper. Amen? Amen? But you can choose to cross the Jordan and sit down a little, under a little shady tree and drink your lemonade for the rest of your life. Go ahead. You're in. You're safe. If you're really in. But there are going to be some that are going to say, no, 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 no. Is there more? Is there more? It takes discipline and routine. Most of us are disciplined to go to work. It's a routine. Why? Because we're getting money. How much more? Not the eternal treasures that come from the word of God. Money? What's money compared to the master? Hallelujah. Seriously, yes. we're disciplined for many things. Yes. We've got a routine because a check is coming. It takes an attitude of delight and expectancy and intrigue. Like God, blow me away. Go ahead, try it. And then read the full book of Joshua slowly, carefully and prayerfully. And then you're going to find out that the sun stood still for him to win a battle. You're going to... That's amazing. Who in the world can cause the sun to stand still? 
scientifically speaking, it's the, the earth that was, that was paused. But think about that. And then you meditate and you ponder these things. You don't just read it and, and you know, get back to whatever you were doing before, whatever you want to do after. You meditate. You allow him to reveal himself. That's what it means to wait on the Lord. You are to wait for His revelation of Himself. If you're there for a second, you might see His toes. If you're there for 20 years, you might see His face. Spiritually speaking. Far too many people are content with just looking at His feet. I want all that the Lord is. And that's the reason why Moses says, show me your glory. Show me all that you are. And God told him, you can't, boy, you're going to die if I do. <laughs> you can see my backside. You better hide behind this crevice here. Oh, I hope you're understanding something very vital this morning. And I hope it does something to your heart. I really do. I really do. So with delight, with expectancy, with intrigue, like I'm going to meet with God today. But sadly, there are far too many people who reach out for their phones first thing in the morning and turn off their phones first thing, uh, last thing in the day. So, so day and night, they're on the phone. And we're called to be focused on God day and night. And I'm not saying that we can't use this thing that's leeching and sucking us, sucking all the life out of many of us. But what I am saying is prioritize. Prioritize. See, spiritual growth is sacrificial. Spiritual growth is sacrificial. And that's the reason why there are many people who... who who don't like the idea of being pricked or poked and like, oh, just leave me alone already. I'm saved. You might be saved from eternal hell, but are you saved from your bad attitude? Are you saved from your dirty eyes and your dirty mouth and your dirty heart? Are you saved from envy and jealousy? Are you saved from the, wanting the praise of men? Are you saved from the love of money? Are you really saved? You see, that's what it means to, to conquer and to go forward. It's not just to be saved from hell, but to be saved from sin and the power of it. Amen? I'm telling you, there are far too many pulpits that focus on justification. And they don't focus on sanctification and spiritual growth like they should. And that's the reason why we have millions of Christian dwarfs in America and across the world. I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. Because I'm seeing things. I'm watching things. I keep my eyes on what's going on in the world in regards to Christendom, in regards to evangelicalism. I'm not just blindly speaking. I'm telling you what I see. Amen? And I pray that we would not be a part of the number that doesn't want more of God. We don't want to be of the number who is satisfied with just a little. We don't want to be of that number. And all the while God is waiting for someone to take Him seriously. We're distracted. God is saying, come get me. Reading and praying go hand in hand. Reading and praying go hand in hand. This is what it means to, to meditate. We are to pray what we read over our own hearts. That is a practice of mine. Whatever I read in the book, if it's just some more light, I'll pray some more light over my mind. If there's an area in my heart that needs to be washed up a little more, cleansed up a little more, then I pray for that. Whatever it is that's coming at me through the Word, I want that. I want everything that's in this book. Whatever it is, I want to pray what I find 
over me and over God's people. Amen? So then reading and praying go hand in hand. They walk together. Charles Spurgeon was once asked, what's more important? Reading or praying? Reading the word of God or praying to God? And Spurgeon's answer was a rhetorical question. He says, what's more important? Inhaling or exhaling? They're just as important. And if you have one without the other, you have spiritual death or spiritual weakness. Amen? And so we need both. Reading and praying is like breathing. Without one or the other, we die spiritually for the most part. Reading is God talking to us. And praying is us talking to God. That's the way it works. Reading is God talking to us loud and clear. Perfectly clear. And us praying to Him is us talking back to Him. Not talking back to Him, but talking to Him. <laughs> Don't be talking back to God now. <laughs> and both are vital when the goal is a rich relationship. The number one thing you want to do when you read the Word, don't forget this, you look for God. You look for God. You open this book and you say, Lord, show me more of you. Show me more of you. So you look for God. You ask questions like, what is He saying? You want to know the meaning of what, is he say, what he's saying. What is he saying? What does he mean by what he said? Are there other passages that connect to this? Is there more light on this here? Ask questions like, what is he doing? And why is he doing it? Why did he flood the whole world and only save eight people? Because their hearts and minds were desperately wicked all day long. And God is holy, holy, holy. What is he like? He's eternal. He's all knowing. He's all powerful. He explains to us through the examples of the, of the Bible and the stories in the Bible and the characters of the Bible of, of who he is and how he does things. And so we ask questions like this. What is he like? That, that's, that's it right there. Lord, show me you. What are you like? What are you like? I really don't care about anything else, Lord. What are you like? And what does he expect from me? Ask yourself these questions. Read the word of God to know the author. Read the word of God to know the author. This is the main reason why I read the Bible. Just so you know, preparing a message for you is secondary to me. It's secondary. Coming up here to speak to you is secondary to me. When I open this book, what I want to know is God. I want to know God more. And I don't want to speak about God. I don't want to teach God unless I know Him first. And so you have to have the same attitude when you get in this book. You want to know the author. And by the way, again, knowing God is first. And the Bible is special revelation. When you look at creation, that is called general revelation. We know there's a God by His design. We see His fingerprints all over the place. But this is special revelation. We get to know more about God, His character, His mind, His ways. For example, if you go and you look at the tree here next door, that tree isn't going to show you that God is holy, holy, holy. Right? And that He is sinless. But when you look into this book and you see the face of Jesus Christ, you know that He is holy, holy, holy. And that He is sinless. Amen? And that's the reason why this book is so awesome. That's the reason why New Agers spend all their time worshiping creation and can't find God because God has chosen to reveal Himself in this book and they think it's foolish. You see? It takes work. 
takes thinking, it takes reading, it takes praying, it takes asking. Many times, Lord, give me some more light on this passage. And if I have a hard time, I'm going to the dead commentators, physically dead, spiritually alive in heaven. But I want more light. And I don't want to leave this spot until I get some. Amen? And so then, this is how we do it. I'll be a lot quicker now. The next points are shorter. It says that you may observe to do all that is written in it. It's very simple, very plain. That you may observe to do all that is written in it. And so you meditate on the word of God. You don't let it depart from your mouth. You do this day and night. What reason to obey it? To observe and obey it. To live it out. And to not be happy with yourself until you're doing it. Until you're obeying. One of the main purposes of reading and meditating on God's word is to pay close attention and to obey obey everything that is revealed. To do life God's way. Marriage. God's way. Parenting. God's way. Business. Ministry. Preaching. Worship. God's way. And so you go into the Word of God and you read everything it has to say and you're able to bring that into your life. Money management, business, dating. We want to do everything God's way. Evangelism. I believe that every believer must get to the point where they say genuinely in their heart, I want to do I want to know, I want to love, but I want to do. I want to do everything found in this book. I want to do everything that the Lord has revealed, and I want Him to provide me the grace, the wisdom, and the strength to do it. That's what He's saying here. All that is written. He's got five books to focus on. we got 66 more of God. More of what God wants. More light for us. James 1.22 says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Doing. Doing. To open this book and read it and not to do it is deception. The Lord says, believe, you believe. The Lord says, repent, you repent. The Lord says, go, you go. The Lord says, stay, you stay. Amen? Whatever it is. Why? Because God is infinitely wiser than you are and infinitely better than we are. And He wants nothing but good for His children. So then, take all of me. By the way, this word observe, that you may observe to do all that is written in it, this word observe also means to protect the word that is in your heart. To protect the word that's already in there from all enemies. This word observe in picture form is that of a man who creates a wall of thorns all the way around him to protect himself from enemies. That's the picture. That's the word picture of this word observe. In other words, we have to make it very difficult for enemies to try to get in. They're going to get poked. They're going to bleed. They got to get over this wall of thorns to try and get what God has placed in my heart. And then you're ready to fight by the power of God. Amen? That's what it means to observe is to also protect. Also means to pay attention, pay close attention. It says, for then, and only then, right? For then you will make your way prosperous. You will make your way prosperous when? When you meditate on the Word of God day and night. It just means always a lifestyle of meditating on God and His Word. And then it says, if you, if you don't allow it to depart from your mouth, and if you're willing to obey everything that's written in it, He says, then I will hook you up. Right? He says, your way will be made prosperous. 
Now the word prosper in the Hebrew means to push forward. I'm going to give you some pushing forward power, the Lord is saying, if you obey me. You're going, to get, you're going to press through your enemies. You're going to push through like a bulldozer through your enemies, over your enemies. The Lord is saying, I'll make that rocky road straight and smooth. Push forward. In other words, God's word gives us endurance. It fortifies us. It makes us strong. For example, it says, therefore, the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. When we hear God's word, we meditate on God's word, we take that, we put it in our hearts, and this empowers us to press on in every situation, doesn't it? It doesn't matter what it is. Like, what's the coronavirus? I got a king who sits on the throne, right? To live in Christ, to die is gain, and so on. Now, I'm not talking about being careless or heartless, but we have a better understanding of this world and its um, temporariness, right? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So then all of God's promises serve as motivations. The Lord says, I will be with you until the end of the age. The Lord says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Lord says, I have overcome the world. So will you. So you read these things, you think about these things, you let them, these truths, and you let them capture your heart and grip you deep inside and you become powerful. In the Lord's power, by the Lord's word, and by the Lord's spirit, because you can't divide the two. And so we have this understanding that if we obey God's word, if we take him serious, he will prosper our way. Those who have the word of God richly in their hearts will be those who truly endure to the end. It's the way it works. And the word prospers also points to being victorious. Obviously pushing forward, victorious. You're not just pushing forward, but you're winning. You're pushing forward and you're winning. It also means that we're a true conqueror. Conqueror over what? Again, over sin, over Satan, over his tactics, over his ways, over the world, over temptation, over ourself and all our lustful desires. For example, Joshua 11 and verse 23 says, Joshua took the whole land. Wouldn't you want your tombstone to read like that? But there are too many Christians, I'm telling you, it's going to say, they barely attempted to, to take a piece of the land. That's what it means, your way will prosper. Joshua's way will prospered his enemies flattened again he was like a spiritual bulldozer running over all of his enemies in Canaan by the power of God how by just obeying it and not forgetting it and speaking it always and believing it with all of his heart God says I want those and I will do something with those Telling you, the story could have gone a different way if Joshua was more like modern Christianity. Thank God he wasn't. He was unstoppable. Here's a question. How much of the victorious life of Jesus have you taken? Spiritually speaking, Joshua reached the highest point of the Christian life in the Old Testament. He took all the land. See, to take all the land meant to obey God fully the best he possibly could. That's what that points to. His conquering represented his obedience. And his obedience, the result of his obedience was conquering. Make sense? And so then how much of Jesus' victorious, victorious life have we taken? How much of him do we live out? If Satan were to come to you tonight, he knocks on your door, you let him in, and he has a conversation with you, and he tempts you like he tried to tempt Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, would you give in? Do you give in? See? But when you have more of Jesus, metaphorically speaking, more of the land, 
then you have more victory. Amen? More of Jesus, church. More of Jesus. I'm going to close with uh, reading a few passages here in Joshua 23, 1 to 13. And the reason why I want to read these passages is because Joshua gives the leaders that serve under him an awesome uh, address before his death. Let us turn there. Joshua 23, 1 to 13. Remember, he was not to allow it to depart from his mouth. We're going to see it spew out of his mouth. We're going to read verses 1 to 13. Joshua 23. Now it came to pass as a long time after the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies round about, that Joshua was old, advanced in age, and Joshua called for all Israel, for their elders, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers, and said to them, all right, he speaks to the cream of the crop, those who are in charge of leading Israel. He says, I am old, advanced in age. You have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is He who has fought for you. See, I have divided to you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes and for the, from the Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off as far as the great sea westward. And the Lord your God will expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight. That's what the Lord does in our lives to our spiritual enemies. So you shall possess their land and the Lord your God as the Lord your God promised you. Therefore, be very courageous. You know what the Lord told him? Be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. He's giving in the same speech God gave him in command. And lest you go among these nations... These who remain among you, you shall not make mention of the names of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them, nor bow down to them. You shall hold fast to the Lord your God, as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out from before you great and strong nations. But as for you, no one has been able to stand against you to this day. One man... Of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised you. Therefore, take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God, or else, if indeed you do go back and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go into them, and they to you know for certain. That the Lord your God will not no longer drive out these nations from you. In other words, you go back to sinning again. I'm not going to beat your enemies down for you. Because you're teaming up with them. You're giving them your heart. But, he says, they shall be snares and traps to you. And scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes. Until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. That is a picture of the Christian life. That is a picture of the Christian life. And I might go into that with more detail next Sunday because there's so much richness there. But do you see how the word didn't depart from his mouth? This is the end of his life. The man is, I think, 80 years old at this point. And he hasn't let go of the word of God. He is speaking it as though it were fresh on his heart and lips. Beautiful. Lastly, it says, and then you will have good success. Now you give a passage like this to Creflo Dollar or Kenneth Copeland or Joyce Myers. You name the wolf. You give them a passage like this and they're thinking big cars, big planes, big buildings, nice clothes, big names. That is not what the passage refers to. And by the way, they're not even keeping the word to begin with. 
This word success in the Hebrew means to have insight. Insight? Insight on what? Insight on the mind of God. Wisdom in every trial and situation. If you ever run into a strong Christian and you see them overcoming sin, I can guarantee you that they are meditating in the Word of God. They are obeying everything they possibly can. When the Holy Spirit says, you got to get this right, they say, help me. I want to get that right, right now if possible. And they might be going through situations, they might be going through trials, but it looks as though they're just going to bulldoze over it. This is why. Because they've accessed the power of God through obedience and trust in His Word. Insight. Good success in the Hebrew means insight. It means wisdom. You want to be a wise guy in the positive sense? <laughs> you need the Word. In fact, Paul told Timothy, the Word is here to make you wise unto salvation. So the Word of God gives us wisdom. God's Word gives us wisdom to overcome all things. Now this doesn't mean that we won't face trouble. Because Joshua faced trouble on every side, right? But it says that some of these men were so strong in God that a thousand men fell on one side. That was literal. That was literal. They went into Canaan, one man took one thousand down. That is the life of the Christian who takes God's word seriously. That is the Christian who apprehends all the power that the Spirit wants to give him. One man, thousand go down. One woman who loves God and His word, a thousand enemies go down. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. So it doesn't mean that we won't face trouble. It means that we will face troubles with heaven's wisdom to prevail. You're going to face them, but you're going to beat them through the power of God. You're going to endure them. You're going to overcome them. You're going to have the wisdom and the insight to make proper and God-honoring decisions. How do I go about this problem, God? Get into my word, son. I'll talk to you there. Come to my office. I'll talk to you. Last words. I know I said that last time. <laughs> but nobody's counting those. Um, so we meditate on God's word to grow in the knowledge of God, to know God, to seek God, right? To grow in the knowledge of God, to overcome sin, to be a good testimony, and to be able to preach and teach what we learn to others to some degree. Why do you have the Bible in your hand? To know God to overcome sin, to be a good testimony, to teach others, make disciples. Amen? All of us here in this room has the opportunity to receive the graces needed to do all that God has called us to do and to be all that God has called us to be. He is gracious. Gracious. What do you need? He'll lavish it on you if you really want it. With that said, let us bow our heads. We're going to close in prayer. Lord, I know that a lot was said, and there's so much more that could be said. But I do pray, Lord God, that your word didn't go in through one ear and out the other, but that we treat your word as it is, precious, valuable, priceless, and that we take it into our hearts, and that we got a little more light on the Christian life today, and the great significance of meditating on your word and meditating on you day and night, every day. Lord, I pray that we would not allow the word to depart from our hearts, to depart from our mouths, to depart from our everyday engagements. That we would be saturated by your word, Lord. That we would be like the wood that was petrified by elements and turned into stone. That we would be overtaken by your word by your spirit especially in these days 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give him praise in this house today. He's worthy.